which is the whole question of crisis, rural crisis in Australia and the New World Order, is one that really needs two or three hours, but I, I promise to spare you that much tonight, and I hope to get you back before midnight. But something of the complexity of all this perhaps could be uh, understood if I told you of a meeting that I had down in Victoria about 10 days ago when I was the guest speaker of a, the annual convention of the Farm Management Society down in Albury. And the subject I'd been asked to speak on was the New World Order, which created a lot of controversy. Uh, there was some dissension about whether I should be there speaking. Apparently, it's a hot subject. But the most interesting thing to me was that the conference concluded with the convener getting up and telling the audience his experiences. He said, um, I have heard Prime Minister Bob Hawke and President George Bush talking about a new world order. And I was interested in that and I wondered if it had any bearing on economic problems facing farmers. So he said, I rang the Department of trade down in Canberra and said, look, have you any material on the New World Order and could you provide a speaker to our forum so that we can get a bit more information? To which there was a long pregnant pause, the other end of the telephone line, and they said, well, they did have some material on the New World Order, but they weren't quite sure if they were at liberty to release it and they certainly didn't have any speakers. And um, there was a bit of shuffling around where they asked each other what the right thing to do was, and apparently nobody quite knew, so they suggested he get on to the Department of Foreign Affairs, which probably was the right department dealing with that subject. So he rang the Department of Foreign Affairs, and he said there was an even longer, more pregnant pause, the other side of the line, and they said, yes, they did have a lot of material on this, but they weren't quite sure how far they could go in releasing it, and beside that, they didn't have speakers, and they went quite sure if they could help, but why not try the Prime Minister's Department? So he rang the Prime Minister's Department and he said the pause there was the longest of the lot and they said they had a, a lot of material on the New World Order program but they didn't have any speakers and the material they had, as far as they understood, could not be released without the personal go-ahead of the Prime Minister who wasn't available at that particular time. So they were dreadfully sorry but they couldn't help. And he said that was the situation. We have coming over our news services a whole lot of talk about the New World Order and Australia's involvement in it, but apparently we can't get government speakers to come and tell us what it's all about, and that is the reason that I've been invited to speak. And I've got to be honest in saying that over the 20-odd years that I've been looking at this question, that's broadly been the reaction. A lot of people have a vague feeling there's something called a New World Order but uh, it's not one of the things you speak about in polite company and apparently we've reached the stage now where if you want to get on in this hard, cruel world, you're not allowed to speak about politics or religion or the New World Order. And if you keep off those three, you're going to do very well. About uh, ten days ago, we had an article in The Australian by an academic called John Carroll speaking about the whole question of protection of Australian industry. Now, he struck something of a blow by saying that unless we begin to do something to protect our Australian industries, it's now only going to be a short time till we have nothing left to protect whatsoever. And he made the point that since the 1970s, we have decimated half our industries in Australia. That's in a period of 21 years. Half our industries have gone. Whole range of things that we used to produce we don't make any longer. We buy them, and we wonder why everybody jumps up and down and complains about the foreign debt. Now, I want to tell you why we've done that and how it fits in with the New World Order and what the New World Order is. I never really came across the New World Order as a subject until I was lecturing in New Zealand in the fairly early part of the 70s, and I happened to be speaking in a little town called New Plymouth on the North Island. It's a beautiful little... Really, it's a little fishing town that nestles under Mount Egmont, if you've ever been there, on the west coast. And 
I was speaking at that time on the growth of the debt of the third world countries and the fact that they'd already reached a stage. They were trying to borrow money to pay the interest on what they'd borrowed previously, and there's no possible way that anybody can survive doing those sort of things. And at the end of the meeting, a lady came to me and said, look, uh, I've got a little book that might interest you that um, seems to relate to what you're talking about. And I said, look, I haven't got time to, to read it, but if I could borrow it, I'd certainly be appreciative. So she gave it to me, and I didn't have a chance to look at it until I got on the plane coming back to Australia, and I opened it up, and it was a little book called A Common Interest in a Common Fund, which meant nothing to me whatsoever. So I began to read it, and it was written by an Australian economist by the name of Dr. Helen O'Neill, who was, might have been Humpty Dumpty for all I knew. But it was a story of a program that was unfolding through the United Nations for the transfer of control of all basic commodities out of nations like Australia to a division of the United Nations called UNCTAD, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. And what was going to happen if this program was realized would be that 18 international commodity boards would be set up through this division of the United Nations, which would take charge basically of the world's foodstuffs and fibers and minerals. Now that was pretty important to Australia. It listed the sort of things, grain and meat and fibers, like wool and cotton, timber, sugar, coffee, cocoa, obviously think not things we produce here, but then it went on to a whole list of minerals like iron ore and coal and copper, by the time you came to the end of the list of commodities they were considering, you'd virtually touched all what we call primary industry here in Australia. Now, once they had established central control through the United Nations of these commodities, something called a common fund would be set up, which is where the title came from, which would be like a, a kitty, which all nations would contribute into, and they would try and establish what is sometimes called supply management and reserve price schemes, and they would arrange deals between producers and consumers and uh, all, all participating nations, which basically meant every nation in the world because um, everybody, with the exception of one or two, were members of the United Nations, would be compulsorily um, um, required to take part in this thing. I thought to myself, if this thing is really a goer, I would have seen about it in, say, The Land, which is the main rural paper in Queensland or in New South Wales or the Queensland Country Life or the Grain Growers or whatever it happens to be, or perhaps some of the small business papers, because um, they would be discussing this. I mean, every issue is coming out on marketing schemes and how we attract exports, and if this was really on the drawing board, surely all their members would have been debating this thing hotly. I'd never seen a reference to it. So I thought to myself, it must be a dream that they've got coming up sometime in the future. But nevertheless, coming through this book, there was enough to suggest that a lot of preliminary discussions had already taken place to make me want to know more. And then also through the book came a thing called the New World Order. This commodity fund idea was part of the New World Order. So when I got off the plane in Sydney, instead of going home, I, I looked up the United Nations in the telephone book. And uh, yes, they had a number, and I subsequently discovered they had one of the top real estate spots in Sydney, in Martin Place. So I went along there and found quite an imposing building and a big staff, mainly from the third world. Obviously, they weren't helping the Australian employment situation, but nevertheless, all very efficient and sitting behind computers and looking very industrious and busy. And I said to the girl at the inquiry desk, look, I've come across this little book and it seems interesting to me and I'd like to know how it fits into the United Nations and also what this thing called the New World Order is. Oh, she said, well, that we've got stacks of material on that. That is basically the ongoing agenda of the United Nations, all the international discussions and the great conferences and the sessions and the assemblies are concerned with this unfolding world order program. So I said, well, can you give me some stuff that I can take away that I can understand it?
Well, no, we don't have it uh, available to take away, but we do have a reading room, and you can go in there, and we'll provide anything you want. So I said, well, would you bring me everything that I need to understand the full ramifications? Oh, she said, that's a fair bit of stuff. And I thought to myself, this is going to take two or three hours. And she came out with a trolley about twice the size of this table here beside me, loaded up with books and pamphlets and reports that came from anywhere you can think of, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and think tanks in America like the Brookings Institution and uh, conferences of UNCTAD and conferences of UNIDO and UNICEF and then uh, more think tanks in Europe. And by the time you've gone through all this, um, I didn't spend three hours there, I spent three days coming back every morning and sitting down and making copious notes, and I didn't even know what I was really looking for. But gradually, as you went through all this stuff, out of it came quite a clear picture of a program that was already partially under discussion and being implemented, which was called the World Order Program. And it had a number of parts. The first part was a very big program called NEO, New International Economic Order, N-I-E-O that contained a number of agreements, in, in, uh, ingredients, the first of which was that the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, both of which are divisions of the United Nations, would be merged into a world central bank with all the powers that our reserve bank does here in Australia, capable of controlling all lending and investment and exchange rates and transfer of funds from one part of the world to the other and stock exchanges and the whole bit. Now that was a pretty big concept, a new world central bank that would take charge of all the world's lending and investment. And then it was argued that to facilitate this program, the main reserve currency that nations trade in at the moment, which is the American dollar, established at the Bretton Woods Conference towards the end of the war, would be gradually phased out and a new world money system would come in which would replace the American dollar as the money that nations trade in. And uh, there was a bit of a discussion about what it would be called. It would either be called special drawing rights, or one suggestion was Bank Corp, which was a name dreamed up by the, the man who'd actually been involved in setting up the International Monetary Fund, John Maynard Keynes of the Keynesian economic system. And he'd also thought up this idea of world commodity control. Irrespective of what it was to be called, here was a world central bank issuing a new world money system which would replace national currencies and it was a totally new ball game. And the third part was this thing I'd already seen. International control of all the world's foodstuffs, fibers and minerals and uh, supply management and the pricing mechanism and the whole bit. It was a huge program. Now that's spun off into a number of specific pro, um, programs. They had another thing called the Law of the Sea, which was uh, international control of all seabeds and the exploitation of minerals on the seabed and fisheries and a narrowing of territorial waters and a whole range of things like that. So it was a huge program. And I could not understand why it was that we weren't seeing more discussion about this in uh, our rural papers and in business papers because obviously Australia was already at least partially committed to the whole idea. So I began to lecture on it. What I could understand of it and what I'd pieced together and documented, I lectured to farmers and business groups and anybody who was interested in hearing it saying, do you know that Australia was already partially involved in this and have we looked at the implications? And I found on the whole total inc incredulity. People found it very difficult to believe that such a thing was even possible. And farmers on the whole used to treat me with good humored contempt. I mean, you know, if what you're saying is true, was the reaction, we would have seen it. I mean, we're having conferences every other day on marketing and selling our stuff overseas and, you know, we've got our own elected leaders running the farmers' federations and and they, you know, it was really sort of, um, you were trying to push. You couldn't even get people to look at the thing properly. And to show you how absurd it's got, the last time I was lecturing over in Western Australia, I was invited by one of their farming organizations, the Pastoralists and Graziers, to go and have a meeting with their executive, which I did in a very plush building in the middle of Perth obviously spent with or built with the subscriptions of 
hundreds and hundreds of pastoralists and graziers. And there they had this, well, it looked very like a, an ivory tower to me. And we went up a few floors and we sat around a boardroom table and we had coffee. And they said to me, you know, when you used to come around about 10 years ago lecturing on this new international economic order, there was always a bit of a flurry and people used to send us tapes in of what you'd said and we'd um, sort of scratch our heads and we'd get hold of the local member of parliament and say, you know, what's this new international economic order? And they'd write back saying, haven't a clue, probably something those nuts in the right wing.